Jackson. In Cuba. Oh. I have to be like, oh. And the nurse is like, what's up, what's you say? Yeah, you're so good. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's getting three in bad handwriting. What? All right, guys, we ready? All right, we're moving on to number 12. At number 12, it says, perform endotracheal tube cuff minimal occluding volume. And then this is very important, suction mouth prior to procedure and record the volume on the flow sheet. All right, so let me, let me show you how that's done. Um, so what we're doing at this point is we're gonna do a minimal occluding volume and the definition of that is we're going to put just enough air in the endotracheal tube a cuff to seal it so it doesn't leak. Just enough. If we put in too much air in the endotracheal tube cuff, what happens? What happens? It damages the tissue. Around yeah. it. it blocks the blood flow of the capillaries. Okay. And what happens when you don't have blood flow to tissue? It dies. Infarction. Yeah, an infarction, right. It dies. And uh, then it becomes necrotic, it can become infected, it can scar, it can cause a lot of problems. You can really damage somebody's trachea. So is it important to check the pressure of the endotracheal tube cuff if you have a pressure manometer? Absolutely. If you don't have a pressure uh, manometer, then you have to. This is the better, this is the best technique available to you. It's called minimal occluding volume. Right. And uh, let me teach you how to do it because not everybody has one of these. As a matter of fact, most hospitals don't have these cuff laters. Have you guys used these? No. no. You haven't used these. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to use this. This is a cuff later. I can take this and I can measure the cuff pressure. And this is great. But these things are, I don't know, a few hundred dollars. And they get lost all the time. And so hospitals just get tired of replacing them. <laughs> and so the staff then, the burden is on the staff to do a minimal including volume. But let me tell you something. Time and time again, and if we're together in the ICUs, we'll do a minimal occluding volume, and then we'll do a cuff pressure, and you're going to see how good that minimal occluding volume works. It is a good technique to put in a minimal amount of pressure to keep the cuff inflated. They're very, very close to each other. All right, so I'm going to teach you how to do the minimal occluding volume first. What you're going to need to do is you're going to need to suction out uh, the Going to need to suction out the pyramid. You're going to need to clean out as many secretions from the back of the throat as you can. Now, sometimes you only get a yank out. Sometimes, if you have a specialized mouth cleaning kit, they have these nice, slender suction catheters that are a little bit more, uh, they're, they're just, a, just a tiny bit more flexible than this, more flexible than this. And you're able to put that thing right alongside the endotracheal tube and get right on top of the cuff. And it works great. You can suction out everything on top of the cuff. <laughs> um, if you don't have that, which many hospitals do not, then this is what, you're, this is what you have. Let me show you how to do this so you don't gag your patient. Okay. No, not 100% sure you're not going to gag your patient, but this way will help you. All right. If you're going to if you're going to suction uh, these patients, this this guy here, is, we just put this out of the way. What you want to do is you want to take this yank hour and you want to put it in the cheek. You want to put it in the cheek. Okay, like I'd stick my finger in my mouth, but I don't know where this finger is. <laughs> but I stick I'd stick this yank hour in the cheek. Okay. And once I get into the cheek, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look now for that missing molar. Everybody's got a missing molar. Everybody's got a wisdom tooth that's been pulled. Mm -hmm. Not yet, huh? That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, most people have a missing molar. Yours to come. Yours is to come. And so what you do is you take that yank hour, you push it in the cheek, you slide back here, and you just feel around for that missing molar. Once you find that missing molar, just drop that yank hour right to the back of the throat here. And that'll not gag the patient. If you try and stick that yank hour down the center, you're going to get a wretch. They're going to, and could vomit. 
and then you got to clean all that out. Makes the matters worse. But anyways, put your yank hour in the cheek, push back, look for that molar. Once you find the molar missing, just push it down. Just gently, always go gently. You're going to push down like this, and you're going to suction at the base of the tongue. And just leave it there. You're not going to be sucking, sucking volume out of the patient. It's not going to hurt them because you're not in the airway at all. But you just leave it there, and it'll gradually pull out everything from on top. You'll be shocked at how much comes out of it. You'll be shocked. And then when you do this side, you want to do that side. You want to do both sides. You want to get it the best that you can. You want to clean out above the cup the best that you can. Now, you want a 10 cc syringe, and you're going to need your stethoscope. Okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to connect. I, I, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is my technique. You can develop your own. When I'm, when I'm holding this syringe for this, I'm holding this syringe like this. Do you see how my fingers are? I have two fingers on the plunger, and I have two fingers on the syringe. And I have my thumb right there. I can manipulate this thing with one hand. I can take air out and put air in. Do you see that? If I hold it like that. I don't need two hands to operate that. And that's going to help me a lot for this technique, because I need one hand to hold the stethoscope, and I need one hand to manipulate this. Does that make sense? You develop your own technique, but that's mine. I usually start out, I just put it in the middle of the syringe, and I, when I connect this syringe to this pilot valve here, pilot balloon valve, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push it in quick and give it a turn. Because if you dilly-dally, dilly-dally means play around. If you play around, then you're gonna let air out. You're let air, just put it in there, give it a good twist, okay, and just hold it. You want to hold the plunger of the syringe, because if you don't hold the plunger of the syringe, it will move back on its own because of the air pressure in the cup. Not always, but sometimes it does. So now I've got my stethoscope in place. I'm gonna, I've got my stethoscope, and I'm gonna just put it on the trachea. I'm just gonna put it on the side right here. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove one milliliter of air at a time. I'm gonna remove one milliliter of air, and I'm gonna listen. I'm waiting for the vent to give a breath, because the lungs will pressurize, and if there's gonna leak, it's gonna leak under the highest pressure. So I'm waiting. Okay, no leak. I'll back up one milliliter. Listen again. No leak. Okay, I'm gonna back up again. And if there's a leak, you're gonna hear it. It's gonna go <coughs> in your ears, it's gonna sound like very loud. It'll make a very loud <coughs> rumbling kind of sound. It's funny to watch you guys do it for the first time because almost everybody jumps. You know, they're like, <laughs> it's so loud. But when you hear that, you've got a leak. You've just created the leak. Once you create the leak, now you're going to seal the leak. Put in one milliliter. Listen. Now I can still hear a little bit of the leak. Put in two milliliters. Well, I don't hear that leak anymore. And me, I'm always kind of half a millimeter, millimeter more, just a half. And then I, I come out and then just listen. That is a minimal occluding valve. And if you, and if you ever get the chance to check your work, you're going to find out that it's usually just a couple centimeters of water pressure below what this is measuring at, which is a good thing. I mean, let, no, let's put it, I'll, I'll fix that in just a moment. You'll find out that it is in the in the proper zone. You'll find out that it's on the lower end of the zone. That's what I meant to say. It's going to be on the lower end of the zone, the safe zone. You're going to see it works good. Now let me just give you a couple caveats. Are we good with that? Mm -hmm. So you're going to first you're going to suction out the, uh, the pharynx. Why? Because we're going to deflate the cup, and if there's a lot of stuff above the cup, and you open you you open up that area, it's all going to drop into the lungs. You have to suction it out first. Once you've suctioned it out, again, 10 milliliter syringe, connect it quickly, firmly, listen. Okay, that's what it sounds like. Draw <coughs> a milliliter, draw a milliliter. Keep drawing out a milliliter at a time until you get a leak. And then you'd add until the leak seals. And then, this is not in a textbook, but I just add half a milliliter more. And my pressures are always good because I've checked them. Um, anyways.
let me give you some, just a little side notes on what can happen during this. Okay. There can be so much edema in that trachea, you can pull every single drop of air out of that cup. It can be go completely flat. This, this uh, pilot balloon can be sucked completely flat, just like this, watch. You see how that's flat? You see how that's flat? It can happen like that, and you still don't have a leak because there is so much edema in there. So all I do in that case is I just put just a little bit more air in there, just a little bit more air, and I leave it like that. You can't create the leak. The other thing that can happen is that sometimes uh, the, the cuff adheres to the trachea. It's just been there for a little while, and it's, it adheres to it, and it's stuck to it. And so what will happen is, is that you'll draw every little bit of air out, and there's no leak. But if you just leave it for a minute or two, sometimes it just loosens up and comes off the, the wall. And then you get this huge leak. So I mean, sometimes it's just stuck. Sometimes it's edema. Don't be surprised if you draw everything out and you don't get a leak. It happens once in a while. The other thing that you'll come across is that if the head is malpositioned, if the head is down or to the side like this, that'll put more pressure on that area and you won't be able to create a leak. And so I always recommend that you straighten your patient's head up and you may have to take the pillow out just to get the neck back. You may have to do that, you may not. You may take out one milliliter, you get a big leak, and you fix it. It's not a big deal. But anyways, um, these are just a couple of things you can do just to make sure that you got a good technique. Professor, for the practicum, how many milliliters are we? You just, it's up to your imagination. Okay. Yeah, take out three, put back in one and a half. Okay. Um, whatever, it's up to your imagination. But you're always going to be able to create a leak. You know, it's an imaginary leak because we, we can't actually create a leak here because we're not ventilating the patient. So it has we have to simulate this. Okay, we good with that? Now, this is a cup flavor. This measures the actual pressure in the in the endotribular tube cup. It's a great tool. I love this tool. When I go to clinic, guess what I do? I steal it out of the cabinet and I put it in my bag and I carry it to clinic with me. And I show you guys, hey, do the minimal including. Let's let's check. And you see how good that worked? And you'll see. Anyways, but the hospitals don't have these things because they get lost all the time. They just get lost. It's too expensive. But this this is easy. Let me uh, let me show you how this works. I'm gonna just put. I'm just gonna put an arbitrary amount of air in that cup. And what you do with this cup later is you'll see that there's a little attachment port nipple right here. A little attachment fitting right here on the side. You see that? All right. And on this other side here, there's a little button. You see a little button? That's a release valve. So this here measures, and if it's, if it's low on pressure, I can just squeeze this, and it pushes air into the cup and will inflate it. And you always put too much in when you squeeze. You always put way too much. So then you just put your little thumb here, just give that a little tap and it lets a little air out, lets a little air out, lets a little air out until you get the right one. And you guys, you, you would normally do two, both these techniques. If you had this cup layer, you'd use it. That would be it. You wouldn't need a minimal occluding volume. And if you didn't have this, you'd do the minimal occluding volume. But you got to do something to check the, the amount of uh, pressure that's in that cup to minimize it. Make sense? We just have you doing both of these in this practicum just so you can demonstrate your skill that you know how to do both. Whatever situation you're in, you're in, you can handle it. All right, so watch this. I'm gonna take this and turn it upside down and just so you can see it. But I'm gonna take and, and push these together and holy cow, I got 120 centimeters of water pressure. Do you guys know how much you should have? Come on, say it, you're close. I can see your lips moving. 20? 27 to? 35. Close, 34. 34. Hey, good job, guys. 27 to 34. If we were measuring in millimeters of mercury, if we were trying to push mercury, it's 20 to 25. Because 
Mercury's heavier. So water pressure is going to be 27 to 34. That's the reference that's in your pill beam, and that's the one that I'll use. Okay? Nobody's measuring it with millimeters of mercury anymore. I haven't seen one of those. You can make one, but I haven't seen one in a long time. But look, I got 120 centimeters of water pressure. You think that might be too much if 27 is the middle? So what am I going to do? I'm going to let a little air out. So I'm going to press that little red button. I'm not going to press it and hold it because it'll just go in a second. I'm just going to give it a little tap. You see, I gave it a little tap. I'm down to 80. I gave it a little tap, 60, 60, 40. Okay, I'm about 36. Okay, and now I'm about 20. I'm about 30. I'm about 30. 32, maybe. 32 would do it. Want a little bit more. I'm about 28 to 30 now. I'm in a good safe zone here. And now again, I'm not going to dilly dally getting this off. I'm going to pull it out quick because I don't want any of it to leak out. Does that make sense? So that's how a cup later works. So again, you can, uh, if you, let's just, I'm going to push this back in for a moment. Let's just say I have too little pressure now. Let's say I go in and I've got too little pressure. I've got 10 centimeters of water pressure to add volume to that cup. I'm just going to squeeze it, and I always put too much in it, it's hard not to, but then I just adjust it until I get it where I need it to be. That's simple, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great tool. There is one more tool that you may come across, and it's only at Jackson, and I wish it was everywhere. Let me just see if I can find it real quick. I'm not going to be able to find it that quick. Right now. <laughs> But I'm gonna find it for you and show it. Ah. Awesome. I'll, I'll get it for you and then I'll show it. One, one more place. Let me look one more place. Jackson uses it, and I don't think they use it 100% of the time. One more thing, one more thing here. Let me show you another endotracheal tube cuff. And I think, well, that Jackson uses these, and I think that maybe Kendall Regional uses it. You guys, you been at Kendall? Yeah. Yeah. Do they use the high low evac endotracheal yeah. tube? They do. Okay. This is a high low evac mm -hmm. endotracheal tube. Let me show you what it's, uh, how, it, how it is. Well, that has two wells. Okay. All right. Here we go. You see this endotracheal tube here? You'll notice that we've got two lines coming off. You see that? That's not usual, is it? Okay, this one, of course, you know what this is. This is the pilot valve balloon tube. You see all that? That controls the cup. You guys know what the second one is? To suction? No, to saline. It's to suction. It is to suction. It's not for saline. No. This suction. tube, if you follow it down, it comes right top of that. here. It's a port. See, there's a little port right there on top of the cup. Do you see that? And if you open this and you connect a suction catheter to it, or a suction line, you can vacuum out above the cup. You don't need to stick a Yankauer or anything else to go down on top of the cup to suction it. You just need to conveniently suction from this port. This is very nice. I like these. They're at Jackson. Uh, they, well, they were at Jackson. They may be at Kendall because these, these guys donated this tube to us. And then when you're finished with it, of course, you would just close it back. Or you can connect this to a vacuum and put it on intermittent suction, which means that the suction regulator turns on periodically. But you have to put it at low pressure. You don't put it at high pressure, just low pressure enough to pull the secretions up. 
Anyways, that this is they, they used to call it a high low evac. I don't know what this company calls it. Taper guard evac is what they call it. But anyways, you, you get an idea of what it is. So if you're looking at an endotracheal tube and you see these two things come up, you can realize that this one here is for su suctioning secretions off the top of the cup. I think it's a great idea. Pardon me? If you put saline into that tube right there like that, into this tube, you know where it's going to go? It's going to go on top of the cup. You're going to have fluid in here. In if you have a leak, you're going to go down. Yeah, well, you don't even need a leak because every cup, even though it's inflated, has little folds in the plastic. It doesn't perfectly inflate. There's always a little fold, and it will find its way. Fluid will find its way down into the box. Okay? Um, so I'm guessing that part right there, can you put the saline? Uh, saline, yes, right here. This part, okay. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you're not totally free. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, Judith. I know you can take it, so. Yeah, yeah, that port is there, and if you didn't have that port, you could actually put it right down the end of the trigger. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they look very similar. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Still okay. All right, so we're good with that. Oh, how did you guys know the pressure? Well, I typed it right there, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> the pressure is right there for you guys as a reference. Where? Now you're going to record that on the on your flow sheet. You see where it says record? Okay, you got minimal including volume. The, the volume that you put in there is not how much you took out, it's how much you put back to seal it. It's like once you create a leak, how much volume do you need to put back? And then there's another line for the endotracheal tube copper pressure. And again, we're just asking you to perform both, to demonstrate your skill in both. But on a normal patient ventilator system check, you would only do one. Okay, good. All right, moving on, moving on, moving on. Record the ventilator settings, ventilator pressures, and spontaneous size. Okay, look at your flow sheet on the back. You'll see that you have to record all these things. Let's go through them. You're going to get this information off of your <coughs> monitors and your settings. This is just kind of a generic flow sheet. Most flow sheets have uh, all this information in this first row that they want you to report, and then they have a column for 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, or every three hours, 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, depending on what their hospital wants you to do. So let's go through the first one. We have mode. You're going to write in the mode. AC, BC, uh, AC pressure control, SIMB. Okay, you're gonna have that. You're gonna have to record the mode that your patient is in. Moving down to the next row, F mandatory. That's frequency or respiratory rate mandatory. That's what's ordered and that's what's here. That's the one you input. That's your minimum that the patient will receive of a mandatory breath. <clears throat> and then there's a total, F total. Do you see that frequency total? That is a combination of uh, what is minimum and what the patient is doing on top of that. So if the patient's doing 10 breaths above this set 14, then the total is going to be 24. So that number goes in there. And then you have uh, VT mandatory. That's tidal volume mandatory. That's this number that we're setting. It's not what's coming off the monitors. It's what you have set. And then you have or inspiratory pressure. Do you see that? Or capital P, small i, right? That's inspiratory pressure. If you're in pressure control, you have an inspiratory pressure. On some, one of these vents, it says PC above PEEP, right? On the servo it says PC above PEEP. What is PC above? Pressure control, pressure above PEEP. It is inspiratory pressure. That's all it is, inspiratory pressure. It's used in pressure control ventilation. Now you see then a slash, a forward slash, and then you have what's next? The exhale. Exhale tidal volume. Where's that information come from? From the patient. That's what's right here. Okay, you good? All right, now below that, if your patient is on pressure support, you have to be in SIMV to have pressure support, or you have to be in a spontaneous mode and have pressure support set to put anything in there. So if your patient's not in SIMV for this practicum, which they may be, if they're not in SIMV, you have nothing to write there. They're certainly not going to be in pressure support ventilation for this practice. Okay. We'll put NA. Pardon me? We'll yeah, NA. Just NA. 
And then you have the symbol there for minute ventilation. Okay, so that is not a control, is it? It's something you get off your monitors. So wherever it is on the vent, your minute ventilation. It's not a proposed minute ventilation. Like on your Avia or these other ones, it's not the proposed, like here. Okay, it's not that proposed minute ventilation that's down there, which is the which is the product of the frequency times the tidal volume. It's not that. It is what's actually happening. And that can change. If a patient increases their respiratory rate, that's going to change. If they increase their volume, that's going to change. So you want the, the real thing there. Uh, then it says peak flow or TI. You just put one or the other. He's in volume control ventilation. You're going to put peak flow. Unless you happen to have the servo I, then you're going to put TI. Or if you're in pressure control. If you're in pressure control, you don't have flow. You have inspiratory time. We good? All right. Just explaining the details. And then you're going to just draft out your flow pattern. Then your IE ratio, that's going to be your actual IE ratio. You're going to get that off your monitors. And then you have PEEP set, and then you have total PEEP. Total PEEP is a, is a measurement that you have to do um, to measure for any air trapping. I'm going to create just a little bit of air trapping here to show you how it works, okay? And it's, it's similar to the inspiratory pause that you've been doing, except for this is an expiratory pause. This happens at end expiration, pause, and if there's trapped air, you'll see the baseline in the vent move up. So let's trap some air. I'm going to I'm going to push this rate up to, to, let's just put it to 30 and see how we do with it. Okay. okay. We're trapping air. Let's trap some more. Right, let's give it a bigger volume. <coughs> Okay, now we obviously have air trapping. So let's see how this measures. Big volumes and a fast rate, you can't help but trap air like that. All right, so I'm trapping air here at, at big time. And my set peak is five. So now I'm going to perform the expiratory pause maneuver. You ready? Mm -hmm. Expiratory pause. Okay, did you see my baseline? My baseline was at five. But look, during the expiratory pause, it moved up. And so that is the total peak. That is the total peak. So our total peak is, tw is 26. Holy cow, it's 26. So our actual peak is, we have it set to five. That's what you have here on your, uh, your flow sheet here. You have uh, peak, set. peak set, and then you have your total peak. Your total peak is, so. is that. So we're not measuring the, we're not putting in the difference between Shouldn't have to do that. that should be total P. That is a combination of your trapped air and your set. These numbers don't exactly jive. Oh, okay. 17 on 5 should make 22, but we're reading 26 there. But so we're trapping approximately 21 centimeters of water pressure. And you guys know how to deal with air trapping, right? This is an exaggeration to make a point. You're never going to see anything this bad. I'm just exaggerating to make a point. Okay. So we require the total peak, which is the 26? That's right. And okay. then the difference between the two is how much you're trapped. Okay. So what's yeah. that peak number up there? 
That peep here? That's supposed to no, be. No, no, up. In the oh, that thing? No. It's, it's not making a lot of sense to me. That thing's kind of out of calibration. I'll show you. So I've already, I think I've already explained to you that that's out of calibration. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But in a hospital, hospital. Should be calibrated. Yeah, it should be calibrated. For instance, if I put zero peep on it, it doesn't read zero peep. It's always about one centimeter above. It's out of calibration. Let's see, give it a couple breaths there, let that line collapse a little bit. See, it's reading. This one is reading. It usually reads a little higher than that. But it's a little out of calibration, and I don't know how bad it gets as we continue to trap air. It doesn't look linear to me. Anyways, when you do that maneuver, you've got uh, the air that's trapped and you've got the total peep. What we want on this is the total peep. We want the total peep. Okay, clear enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, the FiO2 that the patient is set on, and then you have P peak. P peak is what? Pressure. Pressure. The IP, yeah. peak yeah. inspiratory pressure. That's the total amount of pressure that's, a, that's uh, in the lung. And then you have P mean, mean airway pressure here. And then you have humidification uh, and temperature. And the only time the temperature is recorded is if you, you have a heated system. If this system is not hooked up on your practicum day, then you'll have an HME like we have right now. And so you just would simply write HME, and then for the temperature, you write NA. Does that make sense? You skip the if there was a heater in line here, and we can't turn these heaters on for the practicum, so what we do is we, we put a little piece of tape there and we write a temperature on it, like right there, and then you would write H for heated, and then you'd write the temperature that you recorded, which would in this case would be 37. Does that make sense? So you only have two things here. You either have an HME and no heater, or you have a heater and no HME. The two can never go together. You guys understand that? You never put both of them in line. Never. It's one or the other. But it has to be something. It has to be one of those. All right, so let me get back over here and uh, go through this. Okay, record ventilator settings, number 14. Perform inspiratory pause and record the flat. There's a place on the back here to record your flat plateau pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right there under PP peak mean. Uh, so that's number uh, 15. Number 16 is perform the expiratory pause, record your total peep. Verify alarm settings. Okay. You're going to need to check your alarm settings to make sure that they're correct. And I'm sure the instructors are going to move a couple of them the important ones probably because they're always moved. You go in there and they're always offset. And so you have to look and see if they're set okay. If they are, leave them alone. If they're not, just uh, some hospitals will actually have a, a, a recording. <coughs> You'll have to actually document what the alarms are. Mm -hmm. That's that's not usual, but so on. And then uh, we're almost finished here, guys, all right? Perform inline aerosol therapy. Yay. We're down there. How many of you guys have already done this? Yeah, you guys have already done this. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's do that. Right. Let me show you a couple different setups. I'll show you what's uh, usual and what's unusual. All right. Here we have, uh, we have, this is, uh, a spring-loaded valve teepee and it is designed to accommodate a small volume nebulizer. Once the small volume nebulizer is pushed up into that, it pushes on a uh, pushes on the spring-loaded valve, it pushes the valve up and now the aerosol can move in and to the patient. And that's how this works. It is either on the inspiratory limb, it has to be either on the inspiratory limb, okay, or you'll find it in front of the HME. Okay? Most of the time, you're probably going to find it like this. The 
you'll have to have what, oops, what do I need? Yeah, you'll have to have an adapter to make this work. You'll have to have an adapter to make that work. There. Okay. All right. So if it's like this, most of the time in the hospitals, it's like this. And we'll put our aerosol, we'll pull out, put our aerosol right in there. Okay? That's the way it is. Most of the time it's like that. You notice, one, that the aerosol is going to be in front of the HME. If it was behind the HME, wouldn't the HME filter out all the medicine? Yeah, it would filter and we'd clog the HME, wouldn't it? All right, so this is the way that most hospitals use it, like this. They'll put the HME, they'll put the HME here and they'll put this T adapter there and then they'll run that like that. That's how it's normally done. If you encounter if you encounter it like this, which again, this is going to be a rare bird here, but I have to show it to you just in case. But if you encounter it like this, we cannot give this aerosol treatment like this with this HME. We have to take the HME out. You would have to take the HME out, and you'd have to connect this directly like that. And this HME would have to be put to the side. Okay. It's, it's not recommended that we keep breaking the circuit, taking it apart, because the more we do that, the more we make it uh, accessible to contamination. In that case, you put a new HME back or you no. use the same one? Use the same one. Yeah, if it's still functioning, you still use it. But most of the time, the way you're going to see it is you're going to see it with the, uh, the HME here and the T piece in front of it. Now, that if you're not using an HME, then this has to be on the inspiratory lid, or it has to be over here. At the okay, not it doesn't belong on the exhalation port because then everything just never gets to the patient. Again, I would have to have an adapter to make this thing work. Is that a breath actuator? Or that device over there? On this vent? No. On that vent? Yes. Or one of these vents. Yeah, the one got a little. Yeah. The right one, they got a little. I know it has a nebulizer. Whether or not it's a, is it every breath or does it continuously run? Every breath. Every breath, okay. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I don't know why Pure and Vanny got rid of theirs, but they did. If this patient was on a, a heated aerosol, but it's just a heater, it would run straight in there. Anyways, I'll set it up with the proper adapter so that you can, uh, you'll be able to do this. So, let me show you, let me show you how to do this. Now you guys have to learn, you know, what I'm talking to you about is not just for this practical. What I'm talking, I'm showing you how you're actually going to do it. Okay, you're actually going to do it in a similar fashion. If you put your, let me just give you a little bit of advice. You'll, you'll probably uh, make the mistake that I'm going to show you and then you'll learn from it. If I, you know, I've already checked my orders and I've already got a, the medicine that I'm supposed to use. If I put this medicine in here, right, and then I connect it like this, okay, and then I walk over to my flow meter and then I connect it and then I turn it on. By the time I get over there and turn it on, you know where that medicine is? That medicine has been pushed mm -hmm down into this tube by the pressure that's exerted by the breath, you'll lose your medicine. Because once it goes down in there, you're not getting it back. It's not coming. It's just going to stay in there. So what I advise you to do, one or two things. Either, you know, put your medicine, you could do it one or two ways, depends how close proximity you are to the patient. But you can Checking what else is up there. Poltergeist. <laughs> All right, here we go. You can do one or two things depending on how close you are to the bed. You can just turn it on now. And it, you have to put this on not eight to ten. No, you gotta put it on five to six. Five to six. You just turn it on and then you can plug it in. Or what you can do is if you're, you know, if you if you have to walk all the way around, mm -hmm. 
And what you what you may want to do is just turn this to one. Just turn this to one. That'll pressurize this line. And then you know you walk over and you connect it. And then you walk back around. Sometimes you have to go behind the bed in this and it may take you a moment. But you walk back around. Once you get back over here, then you'll turn it to five and six. But I'm just telling you, if you put that small body nebulizer with medicine in line with that vent, when that thing pressurizes, your medicine is gone. And then you'll have to find your respiratory therapist and say, please, can I have some more medicine? <laughs> please, sir, can I have some more? All right, so you charge it like this thing. Yeah, you're gonna let them. They're good. The hospital will tell you what they're going to do. All right. So, anyways, you're gonna perform this. You'll remove the HME if applicable. You're gonna set your flow meter from six, six, five to six. If applicable, you're gonna raise alarms. We're almost finished with this, guys. We're almost finished. I know it's a long, dragged out thing, but you know this practicum only takes 35 minutes. <laughs> it, it, you, you won't even need 35 minutes. Trust me. Some of you'd be done in 20. Done, but uh, we give you a, a big bump like here. You like her, yeah. So, anyways, but it takes a long time to explain the detail. But really, what I'm doing now is I'm actually just teaching you how to practice some practice things. All right. So, anyways, what happens when you put volume into this circuit? It's it's not going to happen now because this is not a real circuit. This circuit's going to the back of the bed, but the real circuit's hooked up to the test line back here. But if I connect a small volume nebulizer and I put that thing on six liters a minute, what is that up there? That's five liters a minute. 